uh, we've all met, but we're very lucky to have Dr. Funk right here with us today. Um, she asked for a brief intro, so a very brief, um, but she attained her, her medical degree um, with the Faculty of Medicine Siraj Hospital at uh, Madal University in Bangkok, Thailand. She's been affiliated with them for about 20 plus years now. And she served as an investigator on a number of infectious disease related studies, um, including some terms that we'll all recognize, maybe in uh, macrolide resistant mycoplasma pneumonia, and a study in serotide distribution, antimicrobial susceptibility of Streptococcus pneumonia, um, as well, a lot of work in HIV, and very recently, a, a lot of work in COVID. So let's all uh, take a minute and welcome Dr. Fong. It's to be here with us. And thank you for being here with us. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the team for um, inviting me to share our challenges <laughs> um, in seeing infectious diseases um, in the era of COVID-19. Uh, it becomes more challenging and challenging for us right now. Um, okay, so... So, um, actually, initially, I prepared uh, lots of... Um, I mean, scientific data, but you can let me know if it's too much uh, scientific and we can uh, discuss and talk uh, about our partnership uh, in the later part. So um, I would like to um, start uh, with the campaign of neglected tropical diseases because uh, tropical diseases are, are neglected and affect one in five of the people in the world. And every year on the 30th of January, it was designated as the World NT Day Day or Neglected Topical Diseases Day. And uh, faculty of uh, medicine, Sivaraj Hospital, uh, was chosen to be uh, the representative of Thailand to join this campaign. And we had joined for um, two years because NTD caused suffering to more than 1.7 billion of po population in the world. And we hope that uh, we can um, raise awareness and translate into um, action for prevention and treatment for these tropical diseases. And uh, I would like to take you to Siraj Hospital. We are the hospital, the biggest university hospital in uh, Asia and in Thailand. Uh, we have almost uh, 3,000 beds um, for all departments and it's Riverside. And right now from my window, I can appreciate the beauty of uh, Dao Paya River as well as the Grand Palace just across the river um, to our hospital. So, and this is my disclosure. Um, I received some research grants and also honorarium for uh, the vaccine for some tropical, to prevent some tropical diseases uh, that I'm gonna give a talk today. So um, I would like to start with our first kiss. She's an 11 year old girl who had underlying of asthma. She presented early this month uh, because of high grade fever for one day. She also feel fatigue and had poor oral intake. Um, she received just one dose of uh, Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. And after that, she got COVID-19, but it only mildly symptomatic. Uh, approximately two months or eight weeks prior to this illness. She has no sick contact and no travel history and she lives in Bangkok. On the presentation, she spiked high fever. Her face looked very flushed, very red, injected lips and conjunctivity. She had no other uh, remarkable physical examination. But uh, at the treatment room in our um, OPD, she was found to be tachycardic as well as hypotensive. So any thought from your side? So if you see or encounter the patients like this, who just had history of COVID-19 eight weeks ago and presented with fever and redness of skin. So can I just probably, anybody would like to give some idea of this case? Okay, that, that, that's okay. So I think right now, Missy, you are aware of Missy, right? Multi-system inflammatory syndrome associated with COVID-19. Like actually right now, 
every day daily consultation for us is whether this is missy because right now i think almost 60% of our children had COVID-19. Uh, therefore, whenever they spike fever, they would think of Missy. And this is uh, actually there are lots of case, clinical case definition of Missy or multi-system inflammatory syndrome that normally occur two to eight weeks after COVID-19. And patients would present with fever and the clinical syndromes of at least two or more organ system. And there was evidence of inflammation, but the most worrisome is the heart complication that can cause severe myocarditis. It's a rare complication of COVID-19, but it can be fatal. And uh, you should already recognize, and there were lots of reports from the US as well. And um, ho however, part of the diagnosis that we have to exclude other diseases. So the question to us is whether this is Missy, but when, when, when we got called and when I saw the patient, uh, she looks very flush. That looks very typical for dengue. So this could be dengue or this is septic shock. So it's very challenging for us. And actually at the treatment room, she received through it resuscitation as well as antibiotic to cover as septic shock. And uh, we work up for evidence of inflammation, but her ESR looks normal. And CBC show normal white blood cell count as well as leukopenia, which could be found in both Missy as well as dengue. Her platelets was normal. Um, we work up for other metabolic profile. It was fine. It looks okay. But finally, because if it is Missy, we have to go ahead and treat aggressively with IVIG as well as steroid. But if it's dengue, steroid could do some harm to her as well. But luckily, we confirmed her diagnosis because we sent her blood for dengue antigen and it came back positive for dengue. Um, and uh, we check on the first couple of days of her uh, illness. So this is dengue. So that's why I said, and right now it's rainy season in Thailand and it's the peak season of dengue. So every day question is whether this is Missy or this is dengue. So it's quite challenging. And um, globally, it is estimated that almost 400 million people got dengue infection annually and leads to uh, 25,000 deaths each year. Although these are the uh, map that show the risk area for dengue infection that uh, exists in more than 100 countries around the world. However, 70% of actual cases occur in Asia, especially Southeast Asia. And this is the uh, annual report of dengue cases by the Ministry of Public Health of Thailand, which is definitely underreported. So each year we have uh, reported dengue cases in the range of many 10,000 cases each year. And um, it you will see epidemic of dengue every couple of years because once you have epidemic of dengue, everyone got immune. And when the, the immunity drops, there are four types of dengue. So once you get one type infection, you have lifelong immunity against that type but you can get second, third, or fourth infection by other types of dengue. So therefore, the ep epidemic occur every couple of years. And each year, we lost 10 to 100 cases of dengue, and actually nobody should die from vaccine-preventable diseases. But fortunately, the case fatality rate in Thailand was pretty low, uh, less than 0.5%. And number of dengue cases this year, at the same time of this year, in comparison to last year, it was like three times higher than last year. So right now, it's the peak, the peak of dengue. And yesterday, I also got consultation uh, from the PICU. Uh, one teenager boy who presented with fever and seizure and encephalitis. And, the, and he had history of COVID-19 a uh, couple months ago. And the question, is, and also had severe hepatitis. The question is whether this is Missy. And uh, fortunately, we, we can prove that it's dengue. And actually the patient received treatment for Missy already with the pulse methyl penicillin 
in which it could cause severe bleeding if it's dengue. So, so it's, it's like challenging for us so much at this time. And not only in Thailand, uh, I just look into CDC website and actually in the US, dengue become a nationally notificable uh, condition uh, in the US as well. But a majority of cases are the returning travelers from the Caribbean or from uh, Asia. And uh, this year you have reported at almost 500 cases of dengue in the US already. So you have to be careful as well. A mosquito can take the airplane to the US from Thailand to the US as well. So you can get dengue um, in the US. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are four types of dengue virus, type one to four. They are genetically similar, but antigenically distinct. Uh, therefore, there is no clause protection against each type of dengue virus. So that would be cross, just short leaf cross protection. After you got dengue, you have antibody against four types, but for short leaf, like six to 12 months. And then after that, if you got mosquito bite, you can get infection with another type of dengue. And the genome of dengue virus encode three structural and seven non-structural protein. I would like to draw your attention to the non-structural protein one or NS1. Uh, and this one uh, is the um, important antigen of the dengue virus because it can be detected and the one that I use as the diagnostic test. In the first week or during the febrile phase of dengue, patients are volumic. So we are able to detect the dengue virus by RT-PCR or by detection of the dengue antigen in S1 in the blood. And um, in terms of serotypes, and this is the data from the phase three uh, clinical trial of dengue vaccine in the endemic area, both in Asia, as well as in Latin America. And you can appreciate that all four serotypes of dengue co-circulate in both Asia and in Latin America. But in Thailand, and this is the data from the Ministry of Public Health, you can see co-circulation of the four types of dengue virus, but majority of dengue in Thailand are caused by dengue type 1 and type 2. And it was transmitted mainly by the bites of the female mosquito and majority are EDs, Egypt time. But right now, other type of uh, EDs, um, mosquito can transmit dengue as well, like dengue abopictus. And once the mosquito became infected, when it bite the patient with dengue, uh, it became infected and the mosquito can transmit the virus for the whole of their life uh, to other people. And other rare transmission mode of dengue could be by um, but product, organ donation, as well as vertical transmission. A decade back, I reported the three vertical uh, mother to child uh, couple pair, uh, pairs of uh, vertical dengue transmission uh, from Sirivas Hospital published in Pediatric Infectious Diseases Journal. Oh, way long ago, long, long time ago, but we still, it still exists. We still see those uh, vertical transmission of dengue. Uh, but um, those baby born from the mother with dengue can present with sepsis like, with thrombocytopenia. So you have to be aware of uh, the diagnosis of dengue in the mother, as well as in the baby who present with sepsis like symptom. But fortunately, the long term outcome of this baby looks quite good. And uh, actually, although there were almost 4 million dengue infection around the world, but actually majority, 70% to 80% of those who got dengue are asymptomatic. Only 10 to 20% of dengue uh, develop clinical symptoms. And of those 10 to 20% who develop symptoms, half of them had just mild undifferentiated fever, 40% developed dengue fever, and 10% develop dengue hemologic fever. What are the difference between dengue fever and dengue hemologic fever? Both of these clinical syndromes can have fever, hepatomegaly, and thrombocytopenia. 
However, the hallmark of dengue hemologic fever is evidence of plasma leakage that can lead to shock and, and a fatal outcome. And in terms of clinical cause of dengue and dengue hemologic fever, after the incubation period of three to seven days, a patient will suddenly develop high grade fever and follow three phases of clinical syndrome. An acute initial febrile phase that might last three to seven days, critical phase that lasts only one to two days, but this is the critical phase that a patient can die from dengue. And, and finally, they will turn into the spontaneous recovery phase. And in the first bio phase, the characteristic is the like flush face and lips. A uh, patient can have myalgia, bone pain, and they can have mild um, hemologic manifestation like epistaxis, pectichiae, bruising at the vein puncture site. And we also do what we call tunicate test. And um, this is a very uh, good screening test for dengue. You let the uh, blood pressure cuff to the patients for five minutes, and you're gonna see this petechia, petechiae on the anticubital fossa. And if it's positive, you will see like 10 dots within the inch square. And this is the positive tunicate test. And when it's positive and you check the blood test, you're gonna see leukopenia uh, followed by thrombocytopenia. And this web blood phase would last three to seven days. And the patient will uh, transition from febrile phase into critical phase. In general, other diseases, when the patient uh, became a febrile, they feel better. But in dengue, this is the most critical phase. Patient can have vascular leakage syndrome that can have hemoconcentration, hypoalbuminemia, pleural effusion, and ascites. And during this phase, um, you have to watch for warning signs of severe dengue. And also um, the severe dengue could be not only shock from severe plasma leakage, patient with dengue can have severe bleeding and also can have severe organ involvement like a case that I mentioned to you that we got consult yesterday. Dengue loves liver, brain, as well as heart. It could cause severe uh, or liver failure, severe hepatitis. It can cause many uh, encephalitis as well as severe myocarditis as well. And if you are supportive treatment and monitor the patient closely, the patient will transition to recovery phase. And this is the signature convalescent rash that you could find in dengue. It's like the island of normal skin on confluent pectical latch. Patient will feel really itchy with this slash and the appetite will uh, come back. And finally, after a week, platelets will return to normal. And this is the clinical cause of dengue. Uh, for our patients, she was admitted on the first, uh, second day of fevers. And you can see, you can appreciate the really high grade fever in, in dengue, like persistently high grade fever up to 41 degrees Celsius. And um, whenever we admitted the patient with dengue, we have to put them on insect repellent because we have mosquito in the ward. Otherwise, you will see nosocomial dengue infection. Have you ever heard about that? If you make round, you might get dengue from the patient because the mosquito is all around, although it's not that much. So this is uh, very special. During the febrile phase, the patient is bilimic because we detect an S1. So if the mosquito bite, it can transmit the dengue uh, virus to others. So febrile phase lasts approximately three to seven days. And before the patient entered to critical phase, we're gonna appreciate thrombocytopenia. So uh, we check her CBC again on day five and we found, uh, we uh, see thrombocytopenia. And then when she entered the critical phase, we have to monitor for the evidence of plasma leakage by serial her hematocrit. Her baseline hematocrit was just 40, but because of the plasma leakage, her hematocrit went up to 50. And if you don't monitor her closely enough, she can develop shock from severe plasma leakage. Uh, but uh, we, we, we have to serial check her hematocrit. Like in some patients, we have to monitor like 
uh, every two to four hours. So in this case, we monitor her hematocrit every six hours and give her hydration to make sure that uh, she had adequate perfusion as well as uh, adequate urine output. And finally, uh, she recovered uh, from dengue. And after recovery, she has kind of a little bit less respiratory distress and abdominal distension. So this is her print ex, uh, chest X-ray. It looks quite normal on the upright position. But when we do right rattle decubitus, you can see the through it that leak into her lung. And this is the evidence of plasma leakage. So that's why uh, people with dengue can develop shock because the blood vessel cannot uh, maintain uh, the fluid in the blood vessel and it leaks into interstitium. Uh, but uh, so we have to give her a low dose of diuretics uh, after the during the recovery phase uh, to comfort her. Some patients can have like severe fluid accumulation uh, during the uh, recovery phase and develop respiratory distress. And um, in her case, we also sent for RT-PCR and it was confirmed to be dengue type 2. And actually, dengue type 2 is well known for its severe disease. But I just want to tell you that this is the very uncomplicated dengue that the classic one, but uncomplicated dengue hemologic fever. Uh, two month, two, a couple months ago, we encountered with one case, 13 year old boy um, who had fever for seven days and also had a hepatomegaly and thrombocytopenia. Um, he was admitted in the provincial hospital in Northern Thailand. Seven days after admission, he developed, he still spiked high fever and developed a severe hypotension, uh, really unstable that required intubation. At that hospital, they check his dengue on day three, both for antigen as well as for antibody. It was negative. He also had severe liver failure as well as renal failure. So he was referred to us. I received call at midnight. And the question is whether this is Missy, because if it's Missy, we have to go ahead and aggressively treat with Missy. But when I see the, pic the picture of the patients, I said, my gut feeling is this is dengue. He looks really fresh face, very, and you can appreciate multiple petechiae on him. And I was right. Um, he was confirmed to be uh, dengue. We test again. So timing of diagnosis is very crucial. They test him on day three. I saw him on day seven. We repeat his serology again and it was positive. He has severe myocarditis. He had a really bad cardiac function and his uh, cardiac enzymes went up a lot. So that's why people thought, they, uh, main, other clinicians thought he might have a uh, MISI because the multi-system inflammatory syndrome, the very uh, important organ involvement is cardiac involvement, particularly myocarditis. But this is the case with severe dengue with myocarditis. And uh, he also developed uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis associated with dengue. And unfortunately, uh, we lost this case. So uh, life is not always easy when we, when we encounter. Uh, he underwent, like we aggressively treat him for uh, HLH. Uh, we give him everything, including uh, CRRT. Um, the um, renal replacement therapy try to remove all the cytokines. But this is the first case of dengue that we we lost uh, this year. And the other challenging for dengue during the COVID-19 pandemic, this, the first challenge is the um, different difficulty in diagnosis. But the second challenge is co-infection. COVID can be severe, dengue can be severe. But when you have these two all together, this can be more severe. And the report of uh, co-infection of COVID-19 and dengue, you can have a fatality rate in almost one fifth, in approximately one fifth of the patient. And majority of the report came from Southeast Asia. So we have to keep eye on this as well. As I mentioned earlier, co-infections of SARS-CoV-2 and dengue can be associated with significant morbidity and mortality. So this underscore the diagnosis of both. And as I said earlier, 
diagnosis uh, of dengue can be either by detection of the virus or by serology, depending on the clinical cause of the patient. In the early cause, in the first five days, during the febrile phase, the patient is volemic. So we recommend to test for the virus, either by RT-PCR or by detection of NS1 antigen. But after five days, patients normally develop antibodies against dengue. Um, so uh, we recommend to test for antibody after day five. However, some patients might not develop uh, antibody uh, in the early phase. So you might need convalescent serum one to two weeks later uh, after the illness to confirm the diagnosis of dengue. Uh, therefore, it's quite challenging for us. If it's positive, it's helpful. And this is a study conducted by our team a couple of years back by one of our team in uh, pediatric infectious diseases unit to evaluate the sensitive, the accuracy and uh, sensitivity of NS1 antigen in the making diagnosis of dengue patient. And we found that the sensitivity of NS1 range from 50% to 80% during the early phase, or overall sensitivity of 63%. So that means if, in, uh, if it's negative, we could not rule out dengue, but the specific city is good. If it's positive, it is dengue. In terms of treatment, I mentioned earlier, there is no specific treatment. Majority is supportive care, but we have to warn the patient not to take NSAIDs, uh, either aspirin or ibuprofen, because the patient are at risk for bleeding. And this kind of uh, painkiller or uh, antipyretic drugs uh, in the NSAIDs group can uh, further can aggravate the bleeding. Um, for the patient. So we uh, recommend on only acetaminophen. And we would ask the patient to see every day during the critical phase to make sure that they will be okay without any warning signs or shock. And um, there are many attempts to try to investigate for specific treatment for dengue. And the group from adult science from our faculty uh, conduct a phase three clinical trial of ivermectin, which is one of the anti-parasite that show in vitro activities against dengue virus. Uh, so we conducted phase two and three clinical trial um, for the treatment of dengue uh, infection uh, in adults in comparison to placebo. And um, they found significant um, clearance, shorter time of clearance of NS1 antigen among the patient who received ivermectin and higher clearance rate of uh, NS1 antigenemia in the plasma at the time of hospital discharge. However, there was no clinical uh, benefits of giving ivermectin to the patients. And this study was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases last year. And actually right now, we just uh, finished the clinical trial of ivermectin in pediatric population and uh, the results are still uh, pending and hopefully will be published soon. So right now there is no good news for, for dengue uh, in terms of treatment. However, the good news is vaccines. So right now, uh, we have vaccines available for uh, dengue virus. The only available dengue vaccine uh, in Thailand and most of the countries in the endemic area around the world is the um, recombinant dengue vaccine with a yellow fever, the backbone yellow fever and chimelic with the four types of dengue virus by Sanofi Pasture right now in a, is approved in Thailand from six years to 45 years of age. Uh, in clinical trials, it demonstrates 65% efficacy in prevention symptomatic dengue infection, but it can reduce hospitalization as well as dengue, uh, severe dengue infection in 80 and 90% respectively. However, we noted the better efficacy among those we see low positive before the vaccination. However, after the long-term follow-up for uh, approximately five years, they noted some safety signal uh, among those who received dengue vaccine 
in those who were silo negative before the vaccination. They observed the increased risk of hospitalization as well as severe dengue in vaccinated silo negative patients. And if you know the, um, if you are aware of uh, pathogenesis of severe dengue or the leakage syndrome, the theory is the, we call ADE, antibody dependent enhancement. Normally we see severe dengue in secondary infection. Once you have first infection, you have antibody, but is the subneutralized antibody to prevent the subsequent infection? And that subneutralized uh, antibody can enhance the plasma leakage. So therefore, the theory is the vaccine acts as primary infection because it's the live vaccine for those who were zero negative. And once they get infection, it's like secondary infection. Therefore, right now, for the Sanofi dengue vaccine, the WHO had the position paper and recommend to do pre-vaccination serologic screening. And we would recommend dengue vaccine only to those who had evidence of silo protection against dengue. Those who were silo negative, we won't recommend dengue uh, vaccine because of the concern of ADE or um, signal of severe dengue. However, in the near future, we're gonna have another dengue vaccine from Takeda. Uh, this is also the uh, Kaimalik uh, dengue vaccine for four types, but they use dengue too as the backbone. Uh, and this vaccine also uh, has been conducted in the dengue endemic area, both in Southeast Asia as well as in Latin America. And the data phase three show um, the efficacy against virological then confirmed dengue of 80% and very good efficacy against severe dengue. And actually they just have published data, actually not yet published, but the preliminary data that just presented in the International Congress a couple of years back, follow uh, the patients up to four to 4.5 years. They haven't seen any safety signal concern, the same as they saw in uh, Sanofi Pasture vaccine. And right now, um, Takeda vaccine was first approved in Indonesia just last month. And this vaccine can be uh, given to the patient regardless of the history of dengue infection. So because there was no concern of the ADE after five, almost five years follow up, but uh, we, keep, we have to uh, uh, keep eye on and monitor uh, those effects in Takeda vaccine. And we hope that uh, this vaccine will be submitted to Thai FDA and should be available uh, in Thailand by next year. So um, this is the first kiss. So are you okay with that or any other concern or questions that you would like to raise? I would go through another two cases uh, quickly just to share with you uh, what other topical diseases that we encounter right now. So this is another uh, case, 11 month old uh, boy uh, who was referred to us uh, in March uh, because of high grade fever as well as seizure. Once again, uh, he was diagnosed with COVID-19 four weeks prior to this illness. So therefore the question is whether this is Missy. As, as you see, I think the same as in the US right now, uh, 60 to 70% of our student population had COVID-19. So whenever they spike fever uh, later on, the question is whether this is Missy. Because uh, Missy, uh, the case fatality rate of Missy can be ranged from two to four percent. It's it's way higher than uh, COVID nineteen itself. So the question is whether this is Missy. And actually, this baby also had um, high grade fever, maculopapular lash, injected conjunctivi, as well as CNS involvement. So he had fever. He had two organ involvement at risk, including CNS brain as well as skin. And he also had history of COVID-19 uh, four weeks ago. And uh, on, in terms of inflammatory markers, it was positive. Therefore, he was admitted to PICU 
and was treated as Missy. He received IVIG as well as pulse methylpenicillin. However, when we go into details and ask for the history of sick contact, we got the history. I met round with the medical student and I chose one, one boy who was admitted to our unit, uh, who was six year old boy who was admitted because of fever and skin rash, as well as he refused to walk because of leg pain. And I found that he's the brother of our patient in PICU. He, this, his brother also had COVID-19 about the same time. It's impossible to be the outbreak of Missy in the same household. And we also got the history that uh, the patient's grandmom also had fever, conjunctival injection, as well as joint pain just one day prior to the onset of the patient's illness. So this is another mosquito-borne pathogen in Thailand. And finally, we work up. Uh, he underwent brain MRI, it was normal. He underwent um, lumbar puncture and we sent uh, our CSF specimen to all uh, possible pathogen, everything was negative. But uh, we got the diagnosis, although he received, uh, as per the recommendation, patient under investigation for Missy should receive treatment aggressively and we treat him as Missy initially pending for investigation for the disease that we suspected. And finally, he was confirmed to be Shikunkunya. This is, <laughs> have, you ever, ever, have you ever heard about this? Uh, it's Shikunkunya. This is another mosquito borne pathogen with the same vector as dengue. It's a, uh, uh, it was uh, transmitted by Edis, Egypti, uh, Deng, uh, Mosquito. And Chikunkunya was first established in Africa in 1952. It was called Chikunkunya uh, because of the severe joint pain. So uh, it's the illness of bended walker because after you got Chikunkunya, you can have severe joint pain they call debilitating joint pain, that the patient were unable to walk and it can last for months after recovery from the shikunkunya. So, um, and this is the uh, world map by CDC, US CDC. Uh, you see, you can appreciate that uh, many countries have been reported case of shikunkunya, including United States. <laughs> so I would like to raise your awareness as well. You Not only in Thailand, you might be able to encounter the patient with dengue as well as shikunkunya in the United States as well. And this was reported as of March uh, this year. And uh, this is the report uh, case of Chikungunya in the US. That surprised me as well. You have lots of cases in the US <laughs> as well. So whenever you encounter a patient with uh, fever, rash, and joy pain, not only Lyme disease, <laughs> Chikungunya should be in the differential diagnosis as well. Uh, you should ask for, for the travel history. And uh, so I just want to, and uh, not only mosquito bite, vertical transmission as well as bud uh can be the mode of transmission of uh, shikunkunya as well. So, and uh, it can cause a neurologic complication as well as dengue. And there is no specific treatment. And so far, there has been no vaccine for shikunkunya. Therefore, for these two diseases, vector control, are very important, but it's still very challenging for us, especially in this rainy season, when you have uh, lots of uh, flooding. Right now we have severe flooding, so we're gonna see, so that would be uh, the potential area for the mosquito to lay their egg. So we would encounter with chikungunya, dengue, leptospirosis, as well as those uh, legacial infection like scrub typhus or murine typhus. Um, I don't want to spend too much into details. We use uh, viral, uh, viral uh, isolation or RT-PCR in the early phase of viremia as well as serology. And lastly, a long-term effect. I, as I mentioned earlier, 10% of the patient develop chronic joint pain after they recover from uh, chikungunya.
And last case that I would like to share with you uh, is a three-year-old girl uh, who was admitted to our liver from other hospital uh, in May this year uh, because of high-grade fever, sore throat, and poor oral intake. And she was admitted in the private hospital. And during admission, she developed generalized tonic seizure in which you can appreciate the spasticity of her legs uh, during admission. Um, And actually, initially she was diagnosed as say, some viral infection, but when she was referred to us uh, with the diagnosis of encephalitis, we noted that she has some like ulcers in her throat, small ulcers, like just one or two ulcers in her soft palate, as well as some old, like not really fresh, uh, illithymatous or pigmented macule on her palms as well as her soul. <laughs> Any thought? <laughs> and this is hand, foot, and mouth diseases. So, um, so uh, we diagnosed her with hand, foot, and mouth disease with encephalitis, in which uh, could be fatal as well. Um, she underwent lumbar puncture and she has CSF as preocytosis. Uh, we sent out for uh, meningoencephalitis panel for all the herpes, varicella virus, CMV, enterovirus, as well as bacteria. It was negative. Her EEG show encephalitic pattern, and the MRI in her case show diffuse swelling of the cellular hemisphere, which is the high brain. Normally, when you see the patient with encephalitis from other diseases like herpes simplex virus, it normally for brain. But in this case, it's high brain in the cellular uh, hemisphere, medulla, and pons. And they call this as brainstem encephalitis or lumbar encephalitis, which is the very typical clinical pictures of severe complications of hand, foot, and mouth diseases. So hand, foot, and mouth diseases are caused by enterovirus in the US. The most common cause of hand, foot, and mouth diseases in the U.S. are caused by Kawasaki A16. This is the most common one. In Thailand, both Kawasaki A16 as well as Enterovirus 71 are the two most common uh, cause of hand, foot, and mouth diseases of hand, foot, and mouth disease cases in Thailand. But we also see Kawasaki A6 as well as Kawasaki A10. But the most worrisome is EV71 because this kind of virus, the patient can develop severe and fatal complication, including rhomboencephalitis as well as myocarditis and cardiopulmonary failure. This is a rare complication occur in less than 1%, but as I mentioned earlier, it could be fatal. And this is the recommend the, the clinical management guideline by the World Health Organization. Whenever you encounter the patient with severe hand, foot, and mouth disease that you suspected of brainstem encephalitis or myocarditis, the treatment is IVIG. So in this case, we give IVIG. And um, the data from the epidemic of hand, foot, and mouth disease in Taiwan many years back to compare the severity of hand, foot, and mouth disease from EV71 and Kosaki A16, they found significant more severe and more serious complication and fatality with EV71 in comparison to Kosaki A16 that you saw in the US. And the major complication that I mentioned earlier is the lumbar encephalitis. And the fatality rate among these cases can be up to 14%. And each year we have hand, foot and mouth disease cases, uh, almost 100,000 cases each year. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, we had school closures for almost two years and hand, foot and mouth disease almost disappear. But after school reopening this year, 
we have seen more and more cases of uh, hand, foot, and mouth disease. And right now, the report was uh, more than four, uh, 14,000 cases. Actually, there was one fatal case uh, still under investigation for the cause of the hand, foot, and mouth disease. And, um, and this is the data of the virus that caused hand, foot, and mouth disease in Thailand. Um, the red one is EV71, and the yellow, the yellow bars show Kawasaki A16. You can appreciate that both EV71 and Kawasaki A16 co-circulate in Thailand as a cause of hand, foot, and mouth disease. However, fortunately, this year, data from the Ministry of Public Health, maturity of the virus when are not EV71, good news is not EV71 in most cases, majority are Kawasaki A6. Normally it's 16 like, but it's A6. But, uh, and our patients was confirmed to be Kawasaki A6, not EV71. Uh, normally uh, A6 doesn't cause severe diseases, but uh, this patient has severe case. And uh, in Thailand, uh, we report the first outbreak, big outbreak of Hoxaki A6 in Thailand in 2012. It was reported in emerging infectious diseases uh, almost 10 years back. These patients present with very severe skin lesion, but are actually not clinical severe. You can see it's not only hand, foot, and mouth disease, but you can also see the rash in the buttock area as well. And actually when I saw encounter, and these are the patients that we see right now, you can appreciate the rash look very severe. And we got consult whether this is varicella and whether this is monkeypox, <laughs> because you know that right now there are concerns about monkeypox. And there were report of monkeypox cases in Thailand in, uh, in travelers uh, and those who contact with uh, travelers. So the rash look very severe, very severe uh, vesicular lesion uh, in hands, uh, palms, and soles, as well as in the buttock area. But uh, in comparison to varicella, normally you can see vesicular latch uh, in, the, in the body, in the trunk, rather than extremities. And this, uh, this girl received two doses of varicella vaccine. So this is an example of a uh, severe hand, uh, hand, foot, and mouth disease that we encounter right now. Uh, right now, there is a big out, there, there are many big outbreak of hand, foot, and mouth disease in school that lead to school closure. And you also see the rats uh, in this area as well. But good news is that we just had EV71 vaccine available in Thailand. It was because they only target the vaccine for EV71 and the phase three, this is the introvac vaccine. Uh, it, the, the phase three clinical trial was published in New England Journal of Medicine uh, many years back uh, in China. When they give EV71 vaccine, it showed very high efficacy against EV, EV71 hand, foot, and mouth disease. 97% efficacious in prevent symptomatic hand, foot, and mouth disease, and also prevent 100% for severe or fatal cases, but unfortunately, it doesn't have efficacy against Kawasaki A16 or other Kawasaki viruses. Therefore, we had a serious meeting with the Ministry of Public Health, whether we can use this vaccine to control the big outbreak of uh, hand, foot, and mouth disease in Thailand right now. The answer is no, because most of the cases in Thailand right now is caused by Kawasaki A6 rather than EV71. So therefore right now the vaccine is available as an optional, vac optional vaccine for children from six months to seven months old uh, for those, for the parents who would like to uh, provide the vaccine for their children. So, uh, this is, uh, I would like to conclude that uh, right now, uh, in Thailand, we encounter challenges uh, in uh, diagnosis and management the patient with uh, tropical diseases in the era of COVID-19 because of the overlapping clinical presentation 
of these tropical diseases with COVID-19, as well as MISI and the co-infection of SARS-CoV-2, as well as our tropical diseases can be associated with more uh, severe and fatal outcome. And uh, lastly, I would like to share with you uh, some uh, our partnership. So I just realized that uh, I had been partnered. We, as a faculty of Medicine Serious Hospital, had been uh, partnered with UCLA for almost 10 years, actually, or probably more than 10 years. We received uh, both medical students as well as residents to join our ID team as well. So ID is like mandatory for everyone. Everyone would like to join us because we have lots of interesting cases. We have HIV clinic, uh, we have ID clinic, and we still encounter lots of uh, TB cases right now in Thailand, especially after COVID-19, we have seen more and more uh, severe cases of TB, probably because they uh, delay in seeking medical attention. So you will see all of those cases and we really uh, appreciate, uh, really enjoy having you guys to join our teams in making rounds and seeing the patient in our clinic. And uh, I would like to thank Andy as well as Dr. Kilan to visit us a uh, couple of years back before um, the <laughs> COVID-19 era. Uh, they visited us at Siri Rush Hospital, and I just hope that one day I would have <laughs> enough time or I would have a chance to visit my uh, residents during that visit uh, in UCLA as well. So Andy and Dr. Kiran came during the time uh, when we hosted two or three uh, residents from UCLA uh, in our department as well. And good news, after receiving or hosting uh, residents as well as uh, medical students from UCLA, we are able to send our residents over there as well. And uh, actually we have uh, long-term partnerships and we have sent uh, many uh, residents over there. And many of them right now came back to be our faculty. And for example, uh, 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 this is uh, one of our staff in allergy and immunology right now. She also visited uh, UCLA. And uh, one of our residents, Siri Nut, uh, visited UCLA. And this is James. Uh, I, like, we host him. Uh, Siri Nut also hosts him uh, in Thailand. And when our resident went there, James also take care of our residents. And two years after that, both of them got married. <laughs> so this is a big uh, partnership. So one of our resident, one of Sirila's resident right now got married with UCLA resident because of this long-term uh, exchange and partnership. So I would be, so I think uh, we have very successful exchange program, not only culture as well as education uh, exchange. Our residents, everyone uh, really appreciate and it's like their um, unforgettable lifetime experience in the world-class hospital in UCLA. They broaden their um, vision in medicine because we are in the limited resource country, but they have opportunity to go to, um, as I said, world-class hospital. And um, I think um, actually some of the medical student and resident helping us in preparing manuscript. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, further collaborations uh, in terms of um, research and other uh, activities that could occur. And everyone is welcome to Thailand. Uh, if you come to Thailand, I always said that you should have a time to appreciate the beauty of Thailand, not only spend time to see dengue cases, you should uh, go out and take risks to get malaria <laughs> as well as dengue outside the Rush Hospital as well. So that's all for my talk. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much. And Wesley, I'm not going to, I don't want to interrupt your Q&A, which I know that you have, but I just want to say, Dr. Wanapriya, we welcome you to UCLA anytime. And I can say on behalf of the Global Health Program, we appreciate the partnership with Sirat tremendously. And thank you so much for always taking such good care of our students and residents. My pleasure.
and it's our pleasure, like our residents are so excited and really happy to uh, go out like over the weekend to spend time together so they can practice English as well. I always tell the resident as well as the uh, medical students like uh, because it's not easy for us to do um, professional or medical presentation in English. So actually one of the team from UCLA also joined our morning conference in making uh, medical presentation in English and they are like uh, one of the teacher as well. <laughs> okay, I um, welcome any uh, questions that you may have. And I'll just be here to help. Um, if you want to just type it in chat, I can read it off. Or if you, you're welcome to just unmute and ask away, we'll just try to do one at a time here. If anyone has any questions? Jane? Sure. Oh, hi. Um, thank hi. you so much for your talk. Uh, and I hope I didn't miss this if you did um, bring it up. But I was just wondering, um, since this whole talk is about like, um, a lot of like mosquito-borne illnesses, what are some like public health interventions that you have seen to really work um, to help prevent this? Or maybe some that have been implemented, but maybe have not worked so well? Yeah, so uh, as I said, it's really challenging for us in terms of uh, vector control. Our government try very hard uh, to uh, promote, um, like we have, to promote how to prevent. Sometimes I have difficulty in speaking English, sorry, because I don't have adequate enough sleep. Whenever I have uh, not enough sleep, I have difficulty in speaking English. Sorry, I'm, I'm on service uh, this month. So um, we uh, encourage them to like, try not to have garbage. Like, like we educate people not to have the source of uh, mosquito. Is in the campaign. Uh, we also ask them to stay in the net, even daytime, like they have, because sometimes uh, when people stay at home, uh, they still um, sleep building their time and it's the daytime bite mosquito. So we let them know that even sleeping during their time, they have to put on, they have to sleep in the net as well, because sometimes they open the window because of the hot weather, so they can be bitten by the mosquito. And um, also uh, vaccine is still optional. So we also uh, promote and provide, we call a bit sand, which is the sand that can kill the, the baby mosquito, the pupa <laughs> in, in, in the water. That could be the source of the mosquito and also encourage them to change, like when you plant some, some kind of plants or tree in the water, or you, you have a fish tank in your house, you have to change the water at least weekly uh, to prevent the mosquito to lay egg. Like we, we educate them and we try to campaign that. But as I said, it's not is not easy for us, like although we try and we found actually we have, we call the index, the mosquito index during the COVID-19 pandemic is lower. Is lower because people stay more at home. They have the time to clean the house, uh, to try to not to have the source of uh, the garbage or the source that the mosquito can lay their egg. So the past year, we have seen, we saw less case of dengue, not because of the, we postulate that not because of only the immunity, but also the mosquito index was low because people have time to clean their house as well. So we, we try in many angles, but as I said, it's still not, not easy and still challenging for us. And actually I think right now we gonna, they have the like try to infect the mosquito with some kind of bacteria that make them infertile. So they would not, uh, they would not progress or, or breeding more to be the source. Like there are many research uh, in, con in controlling this kind of vectors. 
So I'm not sure whether I answer you. And, and as I said, we recommend them to put on insect repellent if they go out during nighttime. But that's more mainly for malaria because malaria is the night bite mosquito while dengue is the daytime bite uh, mosquito. However, when there is no people at home, and they are hungry, they can change their uh, activity to be the night uh, bite mosquito as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, you definitely answered my question. I know that like health behaviors are so difficult to change regardless of all the work that like public health and um, like providers try to put in. So thank you. Do we have any other questions? I had one. Um, so is dengue more prevalent in big cities or is it um, equal prevalence in rural areas? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, it can be equal. So it can be anywhere in Thailand, while malaria can be only be found in the rural area, not uh, in, uh, in the city. Because uh, actually, I, I can share, because some of you, uh, some of the residents or medical student took malaria prophylaxis while making round <laughs> in Sinvaras Hospital. So um, actually we had malaria patient, but we don't have nosocomial malaria because the vector of malaria is Anopheles mosquito, not the dengue mosquito. And Anopheles mosquito cannot survive in the environment in Bangkok. They need very clean water. Like, so we don't have anopheles in Bangkok or in the big city. Uh, so therefore um, you don't really need to take malaria prophylaxis in the city, but you need when you go out to the rural area. But for dengue, uh, not only, so in the city, the mosquito is Aedes aegypti, but it's everywhere. However, I said another type of dengue for example, another type of mosquito, uh, which is Aedes arbopictus, which is normally found in the, in the rural area, can be a vector for dengue as well. So that's why dengue can be found everywhere in Thailand. Thank you. But don't worry, you will be safe. <laughs> you just need to check your CBC when you go back. And normally primary infection doesn't cause severe disease. And as I said, majority of uh, dengue infection uh, are asymptomatic. I think we have one question here in chat. I'll read out. Um, how do you think natural disasters, especially with climate change and road traffic accidents exacerbate the burden of infectious diseases in Thailand? Um, I think the climate change does make like, because in Thailand, the, the climate change, some diseases are seasonality. And with the climate change, it's very hard to predict. Like in the US, you can predict that you're gonna see enterovirus during the summer. But when, with the, so we normally see dengue in rainy season. And with the climate change, it, it drains off the season you can see this kind of infectious diseases like off the season. So it's really affect us as well in terms of, as, as I said, some diseases are predictable, but this climate change sometimes make it unpredictable and it can be found off of the season that we have to be uh, more aware of this kind of diseases as well. And the climate change, uh, probably these vectors survive uh, better with the hot weather, with the rainy, uh, this kind of thing, because it's become uh, warm. Global warming <laughs> is good for this kind of vectors to survive <laughs> in Thailand. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? seems like we're good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I mean, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much for, for coming and taking this time answering our questions. We all really appreciate it. Yeah, so I just hope that I would have a chance to host you. And actually, uh, last week we have the, I actually the medical student who joined 
adult IV team, but she said she do both adult in pediatrics, so she would like to join us as well. So we uh, host uh, the medical student in our clinic, and she was so excited to see a uh, patient with HIV, with crypto, uh, meningitis, or TB brain abscess, in which she said she haven't seen uh, for so in her life. So we have lots of interesting cases to see, and all you guys are all welcome to Thailand, and we also have very uh, yummy food <laughs> in Thailand, sticky rice, mango, many things to enjoy when you come to Thailand and hope to see you in Thailand. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.